When I was a kid, only two things mattered to me. Video games and YouTube videos. My favorite games were Skyrim, Minecraft, and TF2. And my favorite YouTubers were Northern Lion, Germa, and Total Biscuit. I remember absolutely chewing through Total Biscuit's WTF Is videos, never pre-ordering video games, like he told me to, and being really worried about net neutrality. John Bain was an inspirational figure for little Simon Zinzovsky, but one particular comment from him is relevant to today's video. This is the epitome of PC gaming, and indeed gaming in general. It, to me, is the best game of all time. Deus Ex. The name implanted itself into my soft little child's mind and never really left. I didn't manage to actually play Deus Ex as a kid. The game was too serious and the graphics were way too old school for 10 year old me. Besides, I was busy bottom fragging TF2 casual lobbies anyway, which was much more important. Deus Ex existed only as a spectre in my mind, a work of gaming genius that I knew I would eventually play, but always seemed out of reach. Honestly, I was intimidated. But no longer. I am now officially a big boy with a university degree and a well-endowed bank account, which makes me perfectly qualified to make a video essay about Deus Ex. We're going to focus mainly on the game's music because that's kind of what I do here and maybe at the end we'll see if we can cook up our own Deus Ex type beat. Let's go. When you first fire up the game you're met with 3D logos floating in space and this music. The Deus Ex title theme establishes a musical approach that will be consistent across much of the soundtrack. That is, the mixture of traditional compositional styles with the sounds of the digital age. A key way that this appears in the title track is through instrumentation. The melody is carried by the string section, which often engages in counterpoint or multiple weaving melodies. It's supported by orchestral brass and large force percussion. But these strings, brass and percussion, all traditional instruments, are presented using sampled synthetic versions of the real things. The instrumentation is also infused with various digital sound sources like chimes, synth sweeps and actual bleeps and bloops. The active, densely textural, and ever-shifting title theme draws on espionage film music like GoldenEye or the Mission Impossible theme without being quite so cheesy. The track differentiates itself from this tradition with its drum and bass parts, which are treated more like part of a breakbeat track than a film score. In terms of harmonic language, the title theme is solidly in E Phrygian, which conveys a level of danger and mystery Phrygian is a diatonic mode of the major scale, and all that means is that it has the same notes as a major scale, but it just starts at a different point. There are seven modes, and Phrygian is one of the most dissonant you could possibly use. This harmonic choice, along with the instrumentation and compositional style, helped the title present the promise of a mysterious and dangerous adventure. Anyway, let's jump into the game. After a quick character creation where you choose a funny name and leave pistols untrained, the opening cinematic fires up. We see two men, who'll turn out to be Bob Page and Walton Simons, discussing the Grey Death, a global plague they've orchestrated as a means to cement their power and undermine old world orders, like the Illuminati. The pair control the scarce Ambrosia vaccine, which they wield as a weapon against political opponents and the populace at large. Page and Simons also run a shadowy augmentation project, which Page predicts will allow the men to live perpetually as gods, who rule in a Tomastic city upon a hill. The track that underpins this entire cinematic is built from synth pads, big washing smooth chords. 
These pads layer over thunderous driving drums that provide an aggression characteristic of Page's violent plans for the future. The latter half of the track continues to highlight Page's insidiousness, which it does with some low-key devious melodies. One melody in particular uses the Phrygian dominant scale. We discussed Phrygian earlier, and Phrygian dominant is the same mode but with a natural third rather than a minor third. It may sound like a small difference, but it really changes the color of the whole harmony. Though not directly connected to medieval religious music, this melody, for me, evokes a sense of antiquity and mystique that ties somewhat nicely into Page's mention of Thomas Aquinas, the insanely based 13th century theologian and philosopher. These swirling melodies build and build into a final climactic ending that really emphasizes the potency of Page's schemes, schemes that you are left to unravel. You play as JC Denton, a newly minted nano-augmented super soldier at your first day on the job. You're a superstar for UNATCO, a UN peacekeeping force, and you're tasked with extracting a hostage and recovering a stolen shipment of the Ambrosia vaccine from the hands of evil terrorists occupying the Statue of Liberty, the National Successionist Forces, or NSF for short. Lucky for you, your older brother has a get-go, which you can use for peaceful incapacitation. Up the platform, watch for booby traps. I don't believe what I just saw. Those were innocents. Now that the game has officially started and you're free to roam around the island adding to your list of NSF casualties, let's cover how music in Deus Ex actually functions. Each location in the game has its own dedicated music that loops while the player is in that area. Depending on what JC is up to, that looping track can change to one of three variants. Firstly, we have walking around music. This is the default variant that'll play as JC sneaks around, picks locks, or gets completely lost looking for nano keys. It all happened an hour ago. The barge docked and the NSF moved right on in, offloading the cargo. If JC decides to use his inexhaustible charm to engage in some diplomacy, the music will shift to something more chatty. That time you showed up, iron and copper. The statue is copper on an iron frame, right? Password's enough, pal. Don't think you know something about the lady I don't. My dad did tours out here. But if JC decides that murdering the homeless or obliterating random noobs is a better use of his time, the soundtrack will amp up to reflect that. You'd like to tear again. This style of reactive music system is very, very common. You'll see it in everything from Oblivion to Red Dead to the iMuse system used in old LucasArts games like Monkey Island. Deus Ex's implementation is pretty stripped back and simple. There aren't a lot of different triggers for a change in music. Now, that simplicity could be a point of criticism, a marker of how old and dated the game is and a differentiating point for modern immersive sims like Dishonored or Prey. This is the world today. You're nothing but a little man. However, I interpret it differently. The simplicity of Deus Ex's music system allows for more focused and memorable music to shine through. As the player, you're provided with a limited amount of music that's repeated more heavily than would be acceptable in modern titles. As a result, you're given a lot of time to connect with the music and the composers are given the space to focus on crafting each individual track to a higher standard. I made a similar point when discussing the isometric Fallout games in another video, but it's true for Deus Ex too. Sometimes simplicity is more focused and more compelling. Anyway, let's get back to Liberty Island. As you explore, meeting plenty of friendly people along the way, you'll learn more about the world and your place in it. You'll eventually encounter Gunther Herman the mechanically augmented agent that has been taken hostage by the NSF. He's upset because you're the new kid on the block, and his rusty metal bones have been made obsolete 
by your newly developed nano augmentations, which don't disfigure the user quite so badly. You might already draw the connection between your augmented status and Paige's augmentation project we saw in the intro, but let's put a pin in that for now. Onwards up the tower you go to confront the leader of the terrorist attack. When you encounter him, you learn that the Ambrosia vaccine shipment is already en route to New York, where they plan on distributing it to the people, rather than letting Unaco hoard it for the rich and powerful. If you decide to spare his life, he'll tell you all his crackpot theories regarding a plutocratic conspiracy, the Trilateral Commission, the Grey Death being a man-made virus for the purpose of controlling the world, and various other stupid stuff. He's probably just crazy. I mean, despite all the facts he has to back him up, but we decide not to believe him and continue on our business as an epic super spy. Having successfully owned the pores, we head back to base. Come on in. The retinal scanner can read blood vessel patterns right through your sunglasses. Remember that Mr. Manderley wants to see you. The Unaco theme is without a doubt my favorite track in Deus Ex, and as a result, one of my favorite pieces of game music ever. It's very much a piece of electronic music, more in the realm of Aphex Twin than anything we've yet covered. It weaves beautiful arpeggios across a dense bassline, all thickened with warm patterns. Each synthesized element is bubbly and has subtle character. The track falls over itself with parts moving smoothly in and out of focus. In that way, it reminds me of minimalist music. The works of Terry Riley and Philip Glass use repetitive structures that undulate against a steady pulse, often refusing to give the listener a focal point to latch onto. I think the Unaco theme does the exact same thing. It allows you to exist inside the density of the music and privileges color over shape. With some soundtracks, the events in-game dominate and confer their meaning onto the music. And that isn't a bad thing at all. It just places the music as the subordinate component. The Unaco theme, I think, does the opposite. It forces its meaning and feeling and emotional character onto the experience of Unaco HQ in the very best way. After interacting with various colorful characters at HQ, including a mandatory trip to the woman's bathroom, we receive our orders from Madly to assist our brother Paul in recovering stolen Ambrosia shipments from New York. We hold up our end flawlessly. But Paul fails to extract the vaccine from the NSF warehouse. We should have sent Agent Navarro. Your brother is timid like a child. Despite Paul's failings, we still got to have some fun exploring Hell's Kitchen and enjoying its music. The heart of the Hell's Kitchen tune is its percussive throughline. Everything about this track is rhythmic and active. It starts very empty, anchored only by a clicking sound with an array of other languid elements bleeding in and out. In this way, it's similar to the Unaco theme, but much less dense. Its furtive nature trades more on the dark ambience of shadowy New York streets. Anyone or anything could be moving out in the dark, and that is sort of what the track does. As it develops, the music becomes a really pounding rhythmic groove. It's not exactly unfriendly, but it is warning. There's thrill in it. The Hell's Kitchen theme is music full of purpose, and the combat variant is also worth noting. It's an extremely high octane ride, and if you've ever played Deus Ex, you'll absolutely remember it. It's like something straight out of Robocop. Returning to Yanako, we learned Paul never came back from New York, which is odd, and you're tasked with cleaning up his mess. This, of course, involves crawling around the sewers and kicking it with some mole people. The sewage system spits you out at LaGuardia Airport, where Paul is waiting for us. He reveals he's turned double agent and is now working for the NSF. The Grey Death is actually a man-made virus, and Paul has proof. We learn more talking with NSF leader Juan Lebedev, 
who has the coolest name of any character in this game, and you cannot argue with me on this. If you kill Agent Navara, which you absolutely should, Lebedev will tell you about JC's past. The Denton brothers are normal humans. They were made in vats and genetically engineered to become super soldiers. This was done by a group called the Majestic 12. Paul and JC are nothing but synthesized tools, purpose built to aid in top down global control. Basically, your whole life is a lie and you've been working for the bad guys this entire time. Remember that pin? Yeah, this is me taking out that pin. Mandalay was on the info link when you met with Paul. AKA he was watching through your augmented lab grown eyes and he is not happy. Given the fact that Paul defected, his kill switch has now been engaged. The same nano augmentations that make Paul so powerful have been turned against him, slowly killing him from the inside out. Yunatko grew Paul, owns Paul, and can kill Paul whenever they want. Back in the story, Mandalay sends you out on another mission to prove your loyalty. But Jock, your pilot, has other ideas. Paul is, obviously, in major trouble and needs your help in Hell's Kitchen. Through a lengthy discussion and the presentation of some evidence, it's clear that Paul is right and Yunako is just the puppet of a malicious shadow organization. Convinced, you try to help Paul but Yunako owns you. You wake up in a cell. Trapped in a cage, you're engulfed in an abstract sound void. Synthetic pieces of sound design swirl around you, and out of them, a definite melody emerges. That melody is JC, escaping from his cell and pressing on into a sinister world. Through the help of a mysterious entity named Daedalus, a reference to the ancient Cretan-born master craftsman, and some French guy, you manage to exfiltrate and discover that you're being held captive by the Majestic 12. Finding Paul, you realize that your nano kill switch has been engaged too. You'll both die kind of quickly if you don't make your way to Hong Kong and get help from the scientist, Tracer Tom. As you bust out of the Majestic 12 compound, you find yourself back in the Unaco HQ. MJ-12 and Unaco are one in the same. Moving through Unatco now does not have the same feeling it did before. The original theme has been shifted and displaced into something uh, recognizable but hostile to your presence. There's still an element of Unatco's goodness presented through the synth melodies, but the underbelly has been exposed and now the track features the same ominous wash as the MJ-12 lab music has. HQ isn't home for JC anymore. Once you land in Hong Kong, you and Paul are finally out on your own, out from under the thumb of Unaco and MJ-12. The mission is now to take them down and stop the Grey Death from decimating the populace any further. Entering the Hong Kong market streets, this music plays. If the Unaco theme is my favorite Deus Ex music, this is a close second. I still remember listening to the mashup of the Hong Kong music and X Gonna Give It You when I was a kid. JC is now working as an autonomous entity for the first time ever. The joy of that is presented by music. The tune's liveliness is really driven by having a lot of short attack time sounds played at a fast tempo. Take the core melody for example, it's a plucky synth lead that feels like it's been modeled on the traditional Chinese guzheng, quickly appearing and then disappearing just as fast. This kind of sound makes the music feel very active, which contrasts with long attack and decay sounds, like the synth pads we talked about earlier, that have more of a lethargic quality. While the track aims to impart a lot of energy, it also has the job of situating you in Hong Kong. Drawing on the guzheng in the string melody is one way to achieve that, but so too is the inclusion of an airy woodwind, sort of like the Chinese zhao. The inclusion of musical material that is referential to pre-existing sound sources grounds the Hong Kong theme in real-world tradition. 
As I mentioned at the start of the video, a lot of Deus Ex's music is about combining traditional musical approaches with the cutting edge digital music technology on offer in the 90s. It almost acts as a predictor of what the future music of Hong Kong could sound like, the same way that cyberpunk as a genre is a predictor of what future societies could be like. The first step of your mission is to convince Tracer Tong to trust you by solving some triad troubles he's having, getting yourself a sweet sword in the process. Once Maggie Chow has been dealt with, Tracer will unfuck your nano augmentation. You and Paul, no longer on the precipice of dying, can turn your full attention to stopping the Grey Death. As it turns out, Bob Page actually owns a pharmaceuticals company headquartered in Hong Kong, Versalite. That is kind of convenient. The likelihood that they're the ones synthesizing the Grey Death is pretty high, so you head over there and kick the door in. In the basement of this seemingly businessy building is a secret Majestic 12 lair full of ominous sculptures, men in black and actual aliens, so naturally you pill for the Grey Death's virus schematics and explode the place. Your resounding success is dampened only by the fact that a large virus shipment has already escaped Hong Kong and you need to head back to New York to stop it from, you know, killing everyone. This time, when you arrive in Hell's Kitchen, the situation is slightly different. Manhattan is under martial law and JC is wanted for a slew of murders. The music has shifted as well. The combat theme in particular is much more desperate and feverish than the original. It's full of these squeaks that are kind of like the sounds of rats screaming, and that's underpinned by a completely unrelenting baseline. Despite the dire situation you're in, you push on, meeting with Stanton Dow, a member of the once powerful Illuminati who has been reduced to pretty meager means. He informs you that the virus shipment is on a freighter he used to own, which you promptly blow up. You've gotten very good at blowing things up by now. He's pleased with this, and after you go meet him inside a crib, gives you the information of his much more useful Illuminati associate Morgan Everett. So it's off to Paris for a little bit of fun. After killing some greasels, hitting the clubs, and ransacking a chateau, you get your hands on Everett's digits, slide the DMs and get an invite to his house. Once you're at Everett's house, you can discuss plans with him in greater detail, but the more interesting conversation occurs with his AI pet, Morpheus. In mythology, Morpheus is the god of dreams. This makes a lot of sense in The Matrix, where Morpheus is the one who wakes Neo up from his dreamlike existence within the Matrix simulation. It makes sense in Deus Ex 2, but in a different way. The Morpheus AI speaks of men and gods with nonchalance, predicting the future worship of omniscient AI deities. It lays out the future path of humanity as if it were fact, with no quarter given to JC's disagreements. In this way, Morpheus has taken the dreams of society and used them as fuel for its predictions of the future. Its predictions are almost certainly fallible. It's only a prototype after all, now reduced to servicing guests with parlor tricks. However, Morpheus's comments about the worship of AI have aged unsettlingly well, as have a lot of Deus Ex's predictions. Underneath this conversation plays the Chateau du Clair music, an unofficial Illuminati theme. It features a harpsichord meandering over a cello in an allusion to the Baroque style evoking some of the antiquity of the Illuminati. Another example of Deus Ex's collaboration between tradition and modernity. Once you finish with Morpheus, Everett sends you over to the headquarters of the X-51 Resistance Group, who can help further your goal of creating a cure for the plague. Unfortunately, when you get there, they're under siege and require your robot-exploding expertise. Once the base is secured, X-51's Dr. Savage agrees to manufacture your vaccine if you save his daughter and retrieve some schematics from an underwater lab. Seems simple enough. There's just one problem. While you've been busy having fun in the ocean, Bob Page has arranged to literally drop a tactical nuke on Dr. Savage's bald ass head like he's playing Call of Duty. It's a bit of a problem, so you, industrious as you are, hit Page with a quick Uno reverse card and send the nuke right back his way. 
Not only that, but you decide it's time to end things and take the fight to where he lives, Area 51. You infiltrate Bob Page's compound at Area 51 and speak with the man himself. His ultimate plan is actually quite simple. Page has created an incredibly powerful AI named Helios and plans on merging himself with said AI. He's nano-augmented out the wazoo so he can make this happen. And once he's integrated with the Helios AI, he'll become something akin to a god, a ruler of all worldly things. You have three ways you can deal with Page. They result in three different endings with three different pieces of music. First up, we have Tracer Tom's approach, which is quite subtle. He wants to blow everything up. Area 51 currently functions as the hub of all the world's technology. And by destroying the compound, you'll set human advancement back hundreds of years. The music in this ending is actually very uplifting. It's full of hope and positivity and humanity in a way that the other endings just don't have. It also puts the title thing, which is fun. If you'd rather stay in power, you can side with the devious Morgan Everett and his Illuminati. You'll kill Paige, which will allow you to recede into the shadows as the invisible hand that guides the world. The music that plays if you choose Everett's side is much darker. It draws on a connection to Baroque music, like we discussed with the Chateau de Clare theme, but is more epic and domination-y, if that's a word. I mean, I think this ending is just JC becoming the bad guy he was trying to stop, and the music feels a lot like bad guy music. I don't know, fight me if you disagree. Lastly, we have my preferred ending, and the most canon one, which is to eat Paige's lunch and integrate with the AI yourself. Helios doesn't really like Paige, thinks he's kind of a dick, and believes that with your judgment and humanity, you two can rule the world together with extreme efficiency and benevolence. The Helios ending theme quotes the title theme, just like the Dark Age ending does, but this piece is a little more troubled. This one is hard for me to interpret, so I'll just play you a bit, and I want to hear what you think about this ending and its music in the comments. So, that was Deus Ex. It's super worth playing the game if you have it or just listening through the soundtrack on YouTube to get a better feeling of the breadth of the music. But I don't think we're done just yet, as you can probably tell by looking at the runtime. What's inside the game is one thing, but what I want to do is tell you a bit, not just about what the music is, but how the music came to be. We have to start by going back to 80s home computing. If you were around in the mid 80s and wanted to do some PC gaming, word processing, graphic design or whatever else people in the 80s used computers for, you had a few choices of system. Apple's Macintosh and the Atari ST were on the market. And while the Atari had a certain popularity among musicians, there was one other option that was perfect for anyone who wanted to experiment with sound the Commodore Amiga. The Amiga had a custom audio chip named Paula, hi Paula, which allowed for four channels of 8-bit sampled audio. To take advantage of this improved hardware capacity, Karsten Obarski developed the ultimate soundtrack in 1987 as a way for computer enthusiasts, nerds like you and me, to produce their own music on Amiga hardware. It worked by allowing users to input commands into seven columns of hexadecimal code. Tracker Music may have started with the ultimate sound tracker, but it didn't end there. Sound Tracker 2, Noise Tracker, Pro Tracker, Scream Tracker, Pog Tracker. Okay, that last one's fake, but the point is that trackers took on a life of their own. They got incorporated into the demo scene, a subculture centered around the creation of digital audio visual artworks called demos. A lot of artists who started off making music and graphics in the demo scene eventually went into the video game industry, sort of a natural pipeline. And this included Alexander Brandon, Dan Gardopay, and Mikhail Vandenbos, who 
use tracker software and their demo scene experience to compose the music for Unreal in 1998 and Deus Ex in 2000. Okay. Uh, wait a second, who actually cares how the Deus Ex music was made? I mean, come on! Some guys used some software and cooked up some tracks. Why does it matter whether they used mod trackers or Pro Tools or just screamed into a granular synthesizer? It sounds good, so just enjoy it and forget the rest, right? Uh, I, I'm not so sure. I think there are a few reasons it matters, and I think you maybe do too, given you've watched this far into the video. Deus Ex doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's necessarily a product of its era, influenced by the culture that created it. Soundtrack and music exists as a part of the DNA of Deus Ex that we can explore and enjoy ourselves. The demo scene. Future Crew, Andrew Sega, and Soundtracker Software is all out there. We can go and enjoy these things, and they'll contribute cumulatively to our enjoyment of Deus Ex when we come back. The history of Deus Ex's music also deserves to be celebrated. Cyberpunk and the digital revolution of the 80s and 90s was a time of limitless virtual possibilities. Computer technology was expanding at such a rate that there were vast swaths of cyberspace to be mapped and explored. That feeling of advancement and innovation is palpable in works of this era. Deus Ex, releasing in 2000, is almost the pinnacle of that. A capstone project that marks both one of the highest achievements in cyberpunk and also the end of its seminal period of relevance. The internet now has been mapped and commodified. This video that you're watching is a known commodity that has limitations and interpretable economic value. That's okay, our knowledge and use of digital technology is much more advanced than it was in 2000, but the possibilities of an imminent cyber utopia or dystopia have been stripped away. But before we go, I want to do something nice for you as a thank you for watching the whole video. Given everything we've learned about Deus Ex's music, I think it would be a shame not to put some of it into practice. So I'm going to make a song just for you. Maybe you should try getting a job. How are the drinks here? Great, if you like hard pits. The Max might have copper wiring to reroute your fear of pain. But I've got nerves of steel. Oh my god, Daddy! What a shame. He was a good man. What a rotten way to die. Here I am again. Like your own reflection. Here I am again. That makes me one ugly son of a bitch. Here I am again. Like your own reflection. Here I am again. That makes me one ugly son of a bitch. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching. And uh, a big shout out to everybody in the credits. Uh, my family, my partner, my roommate, uh, my community, and the Deus Ex subreddit actually. Uh, I made a community post and a Reddit post asking people about their thoughts on Deus Ex's music which really informed uh, how I approached this video. So thanks to everybody who engaged with those. Videos like these take a lot of work, but it's always worth it uh, when I get to hang out and talk with everybody in the comments. You know, it's, it's odd, man. Like people hate on YouTube comments, but I feel like everybody who posts under my videos is super supportive, interesting, funny, massive giga chads. Uh, and if you've been around for a while, you probably know that I'd be up in those comments responding. So uh, I'll see you down there. Now we have uh, the Patreon supporters and this outro is actually re-recorded from the version they got last week. Uh, they get my videos a week early and when I posted it up there, I only had two patrons and now I have three. So I figured I would update the thank yous. Uh, so we have my mum, 
uh, Love Your Mum, uh, and Uke Svedrchuk and Forrest Parron, who are both super lovely internet people. Uh, it really does mean a lot to have strangers uh, support me like that. So shout out to all my Patreon friends. Uh, if you want to contact me, Patreon DMs is one way you could do it. But if you don't want to have to pay uh, to get in touch, my email is in the description, along with a lot of resources and links to Deus Ex material uh, that might interest you. I just wanted to finish uh, with a little life update. I'm currently uh, doing my honors degree in music, and for it, I'm actually making a visual novel, uh, which is about cyberpunk vampires, because that's that's how I roll. Uh, and when it's done, I'll share it around uh, with all of you, which uh, I'm really excited for. Uh, but after that's done, uh, I'm going to try and put out one or maybe two more videos uh, before the end of the year. Uh, I'll definitely have one, but I'm aiming for two. I'm thinking about maybe doing New Vegas or Dark Souls, but we'll see. Let me know if there's a game that you would absolutely love to see me cover. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Uh, thanks for sticking with me and watching all the way through to the end. I really appreciate it. Uh, much love and bye-bye.